As I mentioned in the last hour, it's a privilege to be with you all uh, this morning and looking forward to the week, Lord willing, to share messages of God's truth together, to be encouraged in our common faith, and to be uplifted toward the God of heaven and closer fellowship to him. As we think about living for Jesus this week, and, and that begins with an appreciation for the nature of eternity itself and what Christ has done for us and loving us and enabling us to look forward to an eternity with He and His Father and our Father. I'd like you to turn your Bibles, if you will, to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. And I'm going to start by reading, I'm going to say, admit this and confess this. This is one of my favorite passages in the Bible. I don't know that we're allowed to have favorite passages, but I think I am, and I believe this is one of my favorites. And as we go on through the day, uh, through the morning, uh, maybe you'll see why I feel that way. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 17, verse 16 to start with. Therefore we do not lose heart, even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. There is, mentioned in this text, a weight of glory, an eternal weight of glory. And I want to say to you this morning to begin with that it is heavy, and it is a weight that every Christian shares. Can we imagine anything that's heavier than eternity? There's certainly nothing that's longer. <laughs> eternity. How big is that? We can't even get our minds around it, can we? And then the glory of God that we will share with Him and one another in eternity, just beyond our capability to conceive it. That's weight. The weight of glory is what it's called in this text. And that weight outweighs any negative thing, trial or tribulation or affliction in this life. Those things that we experience in this life, Paul is clear to say, are temporary. Whatever affliction, pain, hardship it might be. But glory is eternal. The things in this life are light. But the things of eternal glory or heavy. So I want to talk about the eternal weight of glory. And to start by saying that the saved are going to share in a glorious eternity. It has been God's plan since before the beginning of time. In Romans chapter 9 and verse 23, uh, the Apostle Paul there speaks of how God might make known the riches of His glory on the vessels of mercy which He had prepared beforehand for glory, even us whom He called. We are those vessels of mercy called by God to experience glory which He's prepared beforehand some earlier time for glory. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 7, listen to this. Paul says concerning the gospel that he preaches, he says, We speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, the hidden wisdom of God, ordained before the ages for our glory, which none of the rulers of this age knew, for had they known, they would, have, would not have crucified the Lord of glory. So God ordained things for our glory, for our glory, before the ages, before time began. God ordained things for our glory. And to those things we have been called, and those things relate to the crucifixion of Jesus Christ for us. So it is the reason then, our glory, is the reason that Christ suffered and died. The Hebrew writer, in speaking about this, uh, the greatness of Christ, says in Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 10, that it was fitting for Him, for whom are all things, and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons to glory, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. This was proper and right. It was fitting to do this. 
God's intention is to bring many sons to glory. And again, Christ died to accomplish that. He is our perfect Savior because of what He accomplished for us at the cross through His sufferings, what is sometimes called the passion, which comes from a Greek word for suffering. Jesus suffered for us. We all, then, like God's only begotten Son, will gladly suffer to attain this glory that God intended for us. In Romans chapter 8, the idea of our glory and what God has done for our glory, as you can see already, is not just kind of slightly mentioned in the passage. We may never have studied this before, but it is our glory and what God has done for our glory is all over the New Testament, as you can see in these passages already. In Romans chapter 8 and verse 16, the Spirit Himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with Him, that we may also be glorified together with Him. His suffering leads to our glory, and that leads us to be willing to suffer with Him. We are willing to suffer the sufferings of Christ to live a life of affliction and hardship, to be willing to be not only persecuted for the cause of Christ, but just to go through our everyday hardships and through all of the problems that we have in this life with faith in God and handle those things the way that He has instructed us to, so that we may inhabit glory together. In 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 1, the Apostle Peter writes to the elders who are among them there, and he says, he says, I am also a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ and a partaker of the glory that will be revealed. Peter's a fellow partaker in all of that. So notice that in everything that we've seen so far, notice that the glory that is promised, the glory that God prepared, the glory that Christ suffered for, the glory that we suffer for, is a collective experience. It's a collective experience. That is, it's shared with everybody else in glory. It's not just about what you experience individually, but what all of us do. Which means that the weight of glory is a shared weight. We'll get back to that in a little while. Going back to the passage we started with. 2 Corinthians 4, verse 17. Our light affliction, which is for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. You notice the us there. But that's not the only place that sort of plural pronoun has, occur has occurred in the verses that we've read. In fact, what we've read, if you go back and think about it, is the hidden wisdom of God was ordained for our glory. We've read that God is bringing many sons to glory. And we've read that we are glorified together. And we've read that Peter is a partaker, a fellowshipper, one who shares in glory. And so it is. It is our glory, our shared glory, that we are striving for. Step back from that for a minute. What does that imply about eternal salvation for all of us? What are we looking for? Is it only salvation for myself that I'm concerned with? Well, if I went around and asked everyone in this room, you'd say, well, surely not. We're concerned about our salvation, but the salvation of everyone else as far as that goes, right? And that's what I'm saying, and that's what Paul is saying, but... He's not talking about it in terms that we normally do, salvation. He's talking about glory, which is what our salvation really is. And that is shared. And just like salvation is not just you being saved by yourself for yourself, but something that you share, the weight of glory then is shared by all of us. 
I want you to see that. I want you to feel the weight this morning. I want you to feel how heavy it is. The salvation of other people in this room. The salvation of your family and of your friends. Salvation of those in other countries. It's a big weight. It's one we must shoulder. The eternal weight of glory. The weight of your glory in my life. That's what I'm talking about. Our future glory is not only shared, but the weight of it is shared. That's what we're saying. For it is greater than all else combined in the world. This is the exact point that Paul is making in this context. In fact, if we could back up just a little bit in the context, and then we'll go forward a little bit, and I think you'll see what I'm saying. Let's back up now to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. And I'll start reading in verse 11. He says, Paul does, that we who live are always delivered to death for Jesus' sake, that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. So then death is working in us, but life in you. Notice the, (laughs) we're being killed, but that's for your benefit. And we're rejoicing in that, by the way. He says, and since we have the same spirit of faith, according to what is written, I believed and therefore I spoke. We also believe and therefore speak. Speak what? The message of salvation, the message of glory, right? And he's sacrificing his life, Paul is, and the other apostles and other evangelists of the day, giving themselves, dying for others, for their salvation. That's the weight. He says, we believe, we speak knowing that he who raised up the Lord Jesus will also raise us up with Jesus and will present us with you. Everybody then experiencing glory. Paul is dying so that others can be saved, so that others can experience glory. And what he's looking forward to is everybody, all those who are saved and are though, all those who are being saved by the preaching of the gospel, experiencing glory together raised up with Christ together to glory. Isn't that what that's saying? Surely so. And so, verse 15, for all things are for your sakes, that grace having spread through the many may cause thanksgiving to abound to the glory of God. Which, by the way, we're all going to share in if we're saved. How about that? So this is Paul's exact point. This is not something Steve, you know, thought of a cool title for a lesson and just decided, you know, this this would be nice to preach on. This is the point of what he's saying. And then you go further in this context, the, the following chapter And we're not going to look at all of that right now, but he he does talk about the assurance of our salvation. Uh, We have a a building from God, eternal in the heavens, and he's looking forward to that. He talks about walking by faith and not by sight, and being, in verse 8 of chapter 5, being well pleased to be absent from the body and be present with the Lord. So all of that is mentioned. We come down, though, to verse 13. and, And there he says, For... If we are beside ourselves, it is for God. If we are of a sound mind, it is for you. For the love of Christ compels us because we judge thus that if one died for all, then all died. And he died for all that those who, who, who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. See what he's saying? We're living for Jesus. Your salvation is of utmost concern to me because it was of utmost concern to Jesus. If I'm living for him and dying for him as he died for me, he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, 
but for him who died. And he died for salvation. It's all about living for Jesus. It's all about living for Jesus. Do you see that? You might remember what I said the theme was this week. Living for Jesus. And living for Jesus is being concerned about the salvation of somebody else besides yourself. And feeling the weight of that so immensely that you're willing to give your life for it. That's what he's saying. We must feel the weight. We must experience the weight. Back up now with me to verses 1 and 2 of chapter 5, right in the middle of all of this. For we know that our earthly house, this tent, if it's destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed with our habitation, which is from heaven. Did you notice the plural pronouns again? We, our habitation, which is from heaven. Preachers are often plagiarists. In fact, every good preacher is a good plagiarist because we get all of our material from the Scriptures. So, when Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 11, if anyone speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God. If anyone's trying to speak the gospel of Christ, they need to be taking it from what the Bible says. And the fact is, a lot of preachers preach sermons on a lot of the same things if they're gospel preachers because they're preaching from the same playbook, right? They're plagiarizing the same source. I am certainly not the first preacher who's ever noticed what I'm telling you today. Not the first preacher to ever preach on the weight of glory. And I say that to share with you something that another preacher noticed one time, one of several who I've noticed preaching lessons on this. He said, it may be possible for each to think too much of his own potential glory hereafter, but it is hardly possible for him to think too often or too deeply about that of his neighbor. The load or weight or burden of my neighbor's glory should be laid daily on my back. A load so heavy that only humility can carry it. And the backs of the proud will be broken. I believe he's right. Because if my life is about my life, it's not about your glory anymore. Paul's talking about dying for others, living and dying for others. He's talking about doing all that he's done for the glory of others. He's talking about giving up his life so that others could have glory and he could share that with them eventually in eternity. So all of our own desires and our own pride and our own, I want to live my life this way and enjoy this and do that and whatever else it might be that we think we have control of in our lives is forfeited for the glory of others. But your life is no longer about your life. It's about somebody else's life. It's exactly what Paul will say in Philippians chapter 2. That you'll look, if you have the mind of Christ, not only for your interests, but also for the interests of others. Your life becomes about that. We are together, groaning for glory. In this we groan earnestly, verse 2, desiring to be clothed with our habitation, which is from heaven. This is what we're longing for. There are, in this world, no ordinary people. Not really. We all look ordinary. We may have ordinary abilities and ordinary intelligence and ordinary lots of things. That's something we'll talk about later too this week, Lord willing. But, 
Nobody's really ordinary. Because every human being is endowed with an immortal soul. It is immortals that we joke with and play with and go to school with and work with and marry. It is immortals that are our children, our parents, our friends, our neighbors, and even our enemies. And love for them must be true and costly with awareness that every one of them has sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The glory of God. We've all fallen short of it. And that the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. God desires them to be saved and glorified. God desires you and I to be saved and glorified. And so we too must have an all-consuming desire for the glory of all. When I think about the Apostle Paul and all that he went through so that others may share in this glory, some of the most difficult tribulations and afflictions and persecutions that he endured came at the hands of his fellow countrymen. And I could only imagine if we had been in that place ourselves, if we had endured what he'd endured, all the, the beatings, the imprisonments, the, uh, just everything, uh, stonings. Uh, you, you, you think about, uh, if, if we had, any of us, li lived to tell the story of being stoned even one time, you would not forget that for the rest of your life. You would not forget the people who did it to you for the rest of your life. You've probably been hurt by somebody at some time, physically or in some big emotional way, that kind of scarred you. You've been there? You remember that, don't you? You remember the person that did that? Or the people? How would you have felt about these Jews who did all of these things to you? In, in Romans chapter 9, Paul says, I tell the truth in Christ, I'm not lying, my conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Spirit. Now he has to say all of that before he says what he's going to say, because if he didn't say that, we may not believe him. If he just started out with the next verse, we'd probably say, Paul, you'd be lying, because <laughs> we would not be believing what he's about to say. He assures us that he's telling the truth, that his conscience is clear in what he's about to say. His, his truth is being witnessed by the Holy Spirit. Here's what, he, here's what he says. I have great sorrow and continual grief in my heart, for I could wish that I myself were a curse from Christ for my brethren, my countrymen, according to the flesh. He is constantly bearing the weight of the lost condition of the nation of Israel. The Jews who had been persecuting him in every place. I can't stop my grief and my sorrow for the lost souls of these countrymen of mine. I wish Almost as if to say, he says, that I was lost and not them. What a statement. He's feeling the weight, isn't he? Are you feeling it? Let's go back. We notice again in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. I already went back once, but let's go a little bit further back. All this is circling around our opening text, but go back to 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 8. We are hard pressed on every side, yet not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. Always caring about in the body, the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our body. That's where we read to before, right? 
But now we see what comes before that. All of this suffering, all of this difficulty that he's experiencing, most of it from his own countrymen. We're living for Jesus. We're dying for Him. And we're dying for you. Is what he's telling them. The eternal glory of others is the weight that we carry. Are we willing to sacrifice ourselves for the glory of others? To spend and be spent that others might experience eternity. In Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 13, Therefore I ask that you do not lose heart at my tribulations for you, which is your glory. Paul is suffering for the Ephesians and for many others. He said, don't worry about that. Don't lose heart at this. It's for your glory that I'm doing this. And if you have to suffer, it'll be for your glory and the glory of others. That's the implication. Don't let that get you down. Don't let the hard times stop you from caring for others and doing what needs to be done to affect their salvation, whatever sacrifice it might mean to yourself. He writes to Timothy toward the end of his life. As far as we know, 2 Timothy is the last letter that he wrote. He's in prison at the time. He's already been before Caesar on one occasion. He's waiting for yet another defense. And he writes to Timothy, he says, Therefore I endure all things for the sake of the elect, that they also may obtain salvation, which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. I'm going through everything for everybody, for the elect of God, that they may experience eternal glory. All of this. And he's, he's, a, he's about to be put to death, if not shortly after, not too long after. He writes those words. Well, glory awaits. Glory awaits. It awaits us. It can be yours. But is it going to be others? Will the glory of others be what causes you to rejoice in the moment that you stand before Jesus? That is what Paul said, isn't it, about himself? 1 Thessalonians 2 and verse 19, to these new Christians that he'd barely got time to spend with, but he brought them to know the Lord and to obey the gospel. And he says, what is our hope, our crown, or crown of rejoicing, or joy? Is it not even you in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ that is coming? You are our glory and joy. To be in the presence of those whose salvation we have helped affect with the Savior. There's glory. There's joy. Glory awaits. It can be yours. Will it be your husband's? Will it be your wife's? Your children? Your friend? Your neighbor? Your co-worker? Your fellow brother or sister in Christ? could be up to you. It could be up to you. I want you to feel the weight of that. Are you praying for it? Are you working toward it? Are you sacrificing for it? Giving of yourself and giving up yourself and everything that's about you so that somebody else can go to heaven. It is a tall order Glory is in heaven. And no one can enter heaven except as a child, right? I don't think there's anything more obvious, and I had to think about this a long time. When Jesus said that unless you become as little, humble yourselves and become as little children, you'll, you'll in no wise enter the kingdom of heaven. What aspects of childhood is he looking at? Is he thinking of? We think about humility, willingness to forgive. Those are things children often 
do. A, a neediness, a, a reliance on the parent, right? That's often there. I, I think one of the key qualities of a child that we may not have thought about too much, you know what child children really love to do? They love to get praise from their parents or their teachers or anybody, really. You pat a child on the back and you said, wow, that was a good job. You, you, they show you this coloring thing that they did and you can't even tell what it is, but it looks like a bunch of spaghetti, you know, and you say, oh, that's the most beautiful thing. And that just means everything to them. And as they get older and they're playing on the ball field, if, when, you, when you're there as the parent or their loved one and you say, good hit, or they strike out and you say, that's okay, it was a good swing, try better next time, whatever. And you just encourage them, we appreciate the way you played. You're doing great. Son, daughter, they're living for that. What are you living for? Well done, good and faithful servant. Well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Praise from the Father. enter into glory. Thank you so much for your good attention and kindness this morning, and I hope that each of us will think seriously about glory today and about helping others enter into glory and doing whatever it takes, whatever the cost is, whatever sacrifice we might make to bring that about. Jesus died for us. Let us live and die for him. If this morning you are subject to the invitation of Jesus Christ, if you're not a Christian, if you would become one, if you are a Christian and you've fallen away and you're living for yourself instead of for Him, there are things that you can do to be right with God today and you know what they are. We'd encourage you to do them.